Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is saxophone player and Blues Hall of Fame inductee, Joe Sublett. First of all, Apple Music is adding videos. Yes, they're adding both music videos and long-form videos. Not only that, you're going to be able to access it both on iOS and Android. And right off the bat, there's going to be exclusives from a tribe called Quest and Beck, Kali Minogue, and quite a few others. So video is now going to be a part of Apple Music. This isn't the first streaming network that's trying this. Spotify tried music videos for a little bit, and it didn't work out, and they dropped it. And back a few years ago, Tidal also tried to do this, and it wasn't necessarily a big seller for them. That being said, Apple Music has a lot more clout, and of course, Apple is already creating its own content for Apple TV, so a lot of that will be available on Apple Music as well. So there'll be a lot more going on. That being said, there's a reason behind all this. YouTube is faltering a little bit, and of course, what's going to happen pretty soon is they're going to come out with their own new service that's going to take the place of YouTube Red, which again was another failed idea, trying to take the existing users of YouTube and turning into paying users, but no one really went for it. Now what YouTube is going to be doing, and they've been quite open about this, is they're going to add more ads in order to frustrate people so they'll buy into the subscription service, which I don't think is going to work very well. So as a result, Apple Music sees an opening and they're going for it. Not only that, Vivo, which is the video service that's owned by a couple of the major labels, has an exclusive contract with YouTube, but guess what? That contract is up soon. So all of a sudden we're seeing Apple Music get very active in the music video realm. And that should make for a pretty interesting 2018 to see what's going to happen in the music video area. And of course, we're already seeing more of that with Facebook as Facebook also finishes up its deals with the major labels as well. And this has a big part to do with it. Music videos are going to be everywhere pretty soon, so you won't necessarily have to go to YouTube to find them. If you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyowenercircle.com. Check out my Hitmakers Club for access to the Private Mixers Facebook group, monthly deconstructed hits, mixing workshop and Q&A webinars, and for a short time, access to my core training module bonus. Go to hitmakersclub.com to learn more. Now, you've heard all about Gibson's struggles and... <laughs> If you listen to this podcast, you've heard me talk about it quite a lot. And if you read my blog, you also have seen quite a lot there. On the other hand, we have Gibson's big competitor, Fender, which is doing quite nicely. Fender is actually growing at a faster pace than the industry, and they're doing really well with younger audiences. And if you read anything from Henry Juskowitz talking about what's wrong with the guitar business, he's always talking about not being able to get younger people involved in playing guitar and buying guitars. Well, maybe Gibson can't, but Fender seems to be doing very well at it. They're developing a younger audience, and they've also come out with the lower cost line of guitars aimed specifically at that younger audience and also at women who are 50% of new buyers of Fender guitars. There's been a number of interesting things that have come to light about how Fender is doing business. First of all, they're selling a lot more guitars online. A few years ago, veteran guitar players would have cringed, and they probably still do now, <laughs> at the thought of buying a guitar online without actually playing it. And I think if we're going to spend money on a high dollar item, you're going to spend several thousand dollars, you want to touch and feel it before you, you actually buy it. And we all know, if you've been playing for a while, you know that the feel is different. You can go through 10 different guitars, it'll be exactly the same, and yet one will kind of jump out at you. That being said, if you're buying an entry-level guitar or something that's relatively common, it's a little bit easier to buy a guitar online and feel good about it because the manufacturing processes are so much better these days that the guitars just coming out of the factory are better than they have been probably forever. So more and more guitars are bought online. About 50% of those are by women 
And one of the reasons why more and more women are buying guitars online is because they feel intimidated going into a guitar store. So they turn to buying online. Now, this is an opinion. This is something that's coming from Fender. Fender did a big study on who buys their guitars and why. So I'm just giving you the info here. Also found out that 45 of all guitars that are bought, Fender guitars that are bought, are bought by first-time players, but 90% of those will abandon playing within a year. Now, the other 10% are going to be guitar players for the rest of their lives. They're going to keep on buying guitars. We all know it's hard to buy just one. The other thing that's interesting is new buyers spend four times as much on lessons. And that's why Fender is actually doing so well, because Fender has what they call Fender Play, which is online lessons. And this is aimed at a younger audience. And of course, this is developing new business for this company where it's not happening with Gibson. Now, of course, Gibson's problems are its own making. It's not so much the industry, although you'll have Gibson execs that will be blaming dealers and former dealers and just about anything you can think of, but Fender is proving them wrong because they're doing pretty well. Now, we know that Gibson may, in fact, file for bankruptcy by August because there's a whole bunch of loans and bonds that are due then that they don't think they'll be able to restructure by that time. So in that case, it'll probably go bankrupt. There is one company that's going to be helped out from all this, and that's Guitar Center, because Guitar Center is one of Gibson's biggest creditors. And of course, if everything's being restructured by Gibson, it gives GC some breathing room. So in fact, that may help them out in the long run. So we have a very interesting dynamic that's happening in the guitar business right now. Fender seems to be doing better than the industry average. And of course, Gibson is just kind of struggling along. So you kind of figure it out from there where the problem is. My guest this week is saxophonist Joe Sublett, who's both a Grammy and W.C. Handy Award winner, as well as an inductee in the Blues Hall of Fame. His credits include work with superstars like the Rolling Stones, Eric Clapton, Bonnie Raitt, Little Feet, The Band, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble, B.B. King, and a host of others. I spoke with him via phone from his home in Los Angeles. All right, so you have a great background, a storied history, but what I want to know is... How did you get started in this business? Let's go back. You're from Florida, right? No, no, I'm from, uh, I'm from, I grew up in, I, I was born in Florida, actually, uh, but I, I grew up in Texas. Oh, okay. So that explains the Texas influence and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I was living in Corpus Christi. I grew up in Corpus Christi, and I guess I would have to say that, you know, I started playing in bands, you know, with my buddies when, you know, practically, you know, right before I got out of high school and, uh, that's really how I got into it. Was just playing in bands, you know. I love I love music, you know, and um, that kind of got me started. You know, me and some of my close buddies were just pretty quickly became like blues fanatics. You know, at the, at the very first it was R and B, and then it was blues, and uh, so that kind of got us going. You know, originally. How did you get to Austin? Well, you know, we've been playing. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. You know, we, me and a couple, uh, several of my buddies had these blues bands together. And at the same time uh, in Austin w- that we were doing that, there was a scene going on there almost, you know, independent of each other. Uh, and not everybody wanted to play blues back then, but uh, Jimmy and Stevie Vaughn were both playing in various bands around around Austin. And uh, I had this band with my, my friend Sid Sanchez, who I first started playing with. And we had a band and... We were playing six nights a week at this joint. We were just going crazy. We wanted to, wanted to get out of there. And so I knew about uh, the, the group called the Nightcrawlers. And uh, I'd actually seen Stevie Vaughn play with various bands. I'd actually gone to, to Austin went on a trip. And I think I was, we were looking for speakers, speaker cabinets. And we went and saw uh, Stevie play with the Nightcrawlers. And uh, so I'd met him and knew him a little bit. And so... When we were doing this uh, six night a week gig, we said, "Well, let's let's see if the Nightcrawlers will come in and, and spell us for a week," you know. Mm-hmm. And they said, "Yeah, we'll come in there." And it was Stevie Vaughn, Stevie Ray Vaughn, you know. Yeah. I never called him Stevie Ray Vaughn ever, you know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, he was my buddy, and and he was a, a bass player named Keith Ferguson, who later on went to, ended up playing with the Fabulous Thunderbirds and then Doyle Bramhall, 
And Doyle Bramhall's got a son now, Doyle, Doyle Jr., who's played with Eric Clapton, and he produces records and stuff. Yeah. And all that. But this was this was Doyle Sr., and he played drums. And so they came in, and I remember when they first came in, they came over to our band house, and we had a big jam. You know, it was probably the loudest thing you ever heard, but uh, we had a lot of fun doing that. And then, ironically enough, we wanted to get out of that club for a week, we just kind of just get away from it, and we ended up being in the club every night that, that, that the night crawlers played. So we didn't re- end up really getting out of there for a week. We, we ended up being down there, down there every night hearing them play. They were really great, you know, great blues rock band. And so that kind of, um, being aware of Austin and that there were a handful of guys, you know, not a lot of, not a lot of people were really wanting to play blues. I mean, people now have sort of a, they they sort of uh, have a, a a view of it that oh yeah everybody was into this stuff no really a lot of people weren't you know we were playing blues whether people wanted to hear it or not you know we just loved it and so finally after a few years I said well, I got to go to Austin so we we moved there and uh, our band and uh, pretty quickly I hooked up with Paul Ray and the Cobras and that was a band that Stevie Vaughn Stevie Ray Vaughn was playing in at the time and so. That got me into the whole Austin blues scene, playing with the Cobras, playing with Stevie. Uh, there was another great guitar playing na- player named Denny Freeman, who's still out there playing. He played with Bob Dylan for about five years, and most recently. And um, so, you know, I was instantly in that scene, you know, playing saxophone. And yeah. uh, one of the other things that we did besides playing with Paul Ray and the Cobras was there was a club called Antones that had just opened up. And so we backed up everybody. We backed up Buddy Guy, and I played with John Lee Hooker, and we played with Albert Collins, and on and on and on. So to me, that was kind of like blues college, you know? Sure. Blues college for me. And uh, so I, you know, I continued in that scene, and then Stevie left and had several groups that he put together before he finally got Double Trouble together. He had asked me to leave the band, to leave the Cobras, and I kind of didn't really want to leave the band at the time. And but uh, I continued to play with him uh, when I wasn't playing with the Cobras on my nights off. And uh, and so later on, when he got a record deal, he asked me to play on his records. Uh, I think I ended up playing on his third and his fifth record, I think it was. And so I had, you know, Stevie was my roommate. I mean, uh, Chris Layton, who was my roommate, uh, I'd, I, uh, Stevie had said, hey, can you recommend a drummer? I need a drummer. And I said, well, my, <laughs> give my roommate a uh, a tryout, and so he gave uh, Chris Layton a tryout, and Chris ended up being in, in double trouble until Stevie passed away. Yeah, but uh, Stevie, a lot of times, a whole lot of the time, didn't have a place to live, so he was kind of our our third roommate. You know, whenever he didn't have a place to stay, so yeah, I continued. I continued working with Stevie until he passed away. You know, I, I, I think I I just worked on In Step, and that record had come out, and. Less than a year later, he was gone. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so that's the whole Austin thing. I mean, it's 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 probably a lot deeper than that. There's a whole lot of other things that were going on at the time, but that really the, what I was doing with Paul Ray and the Cobras, and then with Stevie and, and a lot of the blues people, was kind of like sort of, I don't know, sort of define who I was as a player. You started in blues pretty much right away, and as you say, yeah. it, it wasn't kind of in fashion at the time. No. So what were you listening to in order to get you into the blues? Yeah, that, that, yeah that, uh, that's actually a really good question because, you know, being a, being a teenager, you know, or even younger, we were listening, you know, like everybody else, we were listening to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and then Cream came along and then Jimi Hendrix and on and on. And one of the things me and my buddy... Uh, Sid, I was telling you about that we would sit around listening to music together. We started noticing who was who. Who were these guys covering when they were covering, I- including the Beatles? You know, it was Chuck Berry, and and then you then you then you start finding uh, uh, Cream and 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 all these different guys were doing blues songs, and so we we would start investigating who who these covers were by, you know, and who was B.B. King. And this is before B.B. King had hit, you know, with, with Thrill is Gone. And so we started digging and finding who are, the, who are these guys' influences. And so we were listening to blues and R&B guys that, uh, that these guys were listening to. And, you know, we found out pretty quickly after Cream came along that, that, uh, that um, Eric Clapton had been with John Mayall and the Bluesbreakers. 
And so we started like really hearing, listening to the influences of these guys. I ended up, uh, ironically enough, I ended up working with John, John Mayall and the Blues Brothers on, I don't know, five or six records, you know, many, many years later. But at the time, we were just going, well, who are all these guys? And uh, Rolling Stones were covering blues songs. And so we started getting our head into that. And, and the other thing about it was in Texas in the 60s and early 70s, Jimmy Reed was on the radio. You know, yeah. uh, Slim Harpo was on the radio and these were, they were being played on top 40 records, scratch my back, which was later on covered by the, by the fabulous Thunderbirds. That was a, a hit for, for Slim Harpo on the radio, Jimmy Reed, which was kind of blues mixed with early rock and roll R and B was on the radio. So even if we didn't kind of realize that we were already listening to blues and R and B on the radio, we just didn't know what to call it, you know? Yeah. And so, um, we already had kind of moved that direction, and then right at the, at the end of high school, Joe Cocker, Mad Dogs and Englishman, Delaney and Bonnie, Leon Russell, these guys came out, and, and they were doing their version of R&B soul blues, and me being a saxophone, their saxophone player that wasn't really interested in Chicago, I liked the band, but I wasn't interested in being in a band playing Chicago uh, music or or blood, sweat, and tears. To me, they were like college-sounding groups, you know, educated sort of <laughs> cats, you know. Yeah. And they're ba 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 da ba and all this kind of stuff. And I was kind of going, that's not for me. I mean, I was still like digging in my head on Stax Bolt. You yeah. Know, yeah. Oh, big Sam difference. Sam and Dave yeah. and yeah, and all that stuff. And and so when I heard, you know, uh, Mad Dogs and Englishmen and uh, and Delaney and Bonnie with a horn section, I went, okay, that's the stuff. It's R and B slash blues, rock and roll, and I dig it. And so, we put a get together a band that was playing that kind of music. The only other band at the time that was playing stuff that had that feel about it was when Rolling Stones were doing uh, Exile on Main Street. And it was once again the same horn section, Bobby and Jim, you know, Bobby yeah. Keys, Jim Price. Yeah. And and uh, so that was kind of a common core, you know, when I was putting these band together, it would be a rock and roll band with a saxophone you know, playing saxophone solos. And, um, and so that kind of moved us away from what was happening. I mean, it was pop music cause it was on the radio at the time, but they were playing R and B type stuff. And, and so when we put together our second band, once again, my friend Sid, we said, hell, let's do some Rolling Stones. And then the rest is going to be like John Lee Hooker. And it's going to be Elmore James. It's going to be BB King, Buddy Guy, uh, Otis Rush, Junior Wells. And so we were a band, really kind of a blues, I guess you call it a blues rock band, but we were playing blues songs, you know, young white guys playing blues and with the occasional Rolling Stones thing. And so we were moving more and more into that direction. And, and what we were listening to, we were listening to old blues records. We weren't listening to anything that was on the radio anymore. We were just listening in our rooms, you know, sitting there looking at a John Lee Hooker record uh you know reading the cover and uh buddy guy okay and who's who played on that record and so we we were becoming more and more those kind of guys and uh and, and uh, if we weren't listening to that kind of stuff we were listening to like old jazz records too okay i get it well let me ask you a question then so you played in the house band at antones and you just said it was like going to blues college what did you learn playing behind those real deal blues guys, the, the originals, that maybe you didn't pick up from the records? Well, I mean, you're right there with them. And so the, the, the feel that you're getting from the Caps and, and the fact that they didn't really, a lot of these guys made these records, but they didn't have really set patterns. They weren't like, you know, when they would do records, it was improvisational. I mean, it was in the sense that it's okay, well, we know the song, we're going to play it however we, how, how, how we feel at this moment. And I really kind of got a feel for it's not where here's the template. Here's the song that you learned off the record. Well, you know, uh, buddy, a guy might call out a song and, and, and not play it at all. Like he did on the record. It was, it, maybe it was a shuffle and it was a 12 bar, but it was completely, I might play with him five nights in a row and every night it was a new thing. And so I got to realize that, well, there's the blues form, but it, it's the feeling more than the form. And, and a lot of blues guys that I, guys that I knew that were playing blues in bands, they were like really copying the form. This is a 12 bar blues and it's a shuffle. And it, that was kind of where they ended as far as like creativity. It was kind of like, well, we're going to play the song. They might as well have been playing, you know, uh, Johnny be good again. 
you know, uh, it, it was it was pretty tried and true stuff. And um, I played five nights with John Lee Hooker. I'm 21 years old, and I asked him. <laughs> I said, you got any, you know, you know, any kind of advice for me and stuff? And he said, uh, well, he said, play the motherfucking shit out of, out of the first note before you go to the second note. <laughs> I love it. And I was going, what? And I thought about it. And he, <laughs> said, he was telling me, if you can only play two notes, playing with maximum intensity, maximum soul, right? Yeah. In his own way. I mean, he was a very, he was not an educated guy, but he was a really smart guy. And, and he was saying, you know, keep, he was telling me it's good to keep it simple. Yeah. You don't have to play a bunch of notes to be somebody. And I really took that to heart from, from that point on. I went, you know what? It's what you say, how you say it. It doesn't have to be really verbose. It doesn't have to be really noty. And I kind of, I mean, that really, that was one that stayed with me. And, um, and so, I mean, I kind of, that, that, I mean, that was good, that was good advice. And a, another one, a guy that I played with, uh, I can't remember which one it was. He had said to me, he said, uh, I had to ask him the same thing. And he said, uh, well, uh, here's the thing you need to learn. I went, he, I said, what? And he said, every time I'm hired, I'm fired. And I went, what, <laughs> what are you talking about? He goes, he goes, well, you know, I might be doing that gig t- tonight and I might have one tomorrow night, but every time I'm finished with the gig, I'm fired until I'm hired the next night. And he was kind of trying to tell me that if you're going to be a musician, you got to get used to having times when you don't work and just kind of be able to accept that, you know? And, uh, and that was another great one because I thought about, it, I think about it all the time. It's like, maybe I'm working several weeks in a row and I'm making good money. And, and then I've got some time where I'm not working. I go, well, every time I'm hired, I'm fired, you yeah, know, yeah. maybe I better save my money and not spend it on the weeks that I'm not working, you know? And, and a lot of these guys had stuff like that, you know, and um, I don't know, well, I, I was just being around these guys, just seeing how they behave, and in spite of the fact of how hard their lives had been, kind of with, with a lot of these guys, the grace that they, they went ahead and showed, in spite of the fact that they were prejudiced and, um, and the things that they had to deal with, it was pretty amazing, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. And it's funny you should mention about the feel as opposed to the form. A few years ago, I went to the Blues Awards in Memphis. Right. I had a record that I produced that I think was nominated for something. So the the artist asked me to go down. And there were blues bands all day long and all night long. And the surprising thing is they all sounded the same. It was all the same 12 bars for the most part. And every now and then there'd be one that would jump out and would be really special. And you go, man, that's it. Okay, that's really it. And it was just what you said. Most of them were just following the form and not the feel. Yeah, and they didn't learn learn that here's the vocabulary. Here's the... Um here's the language that you speak, but go ahead and have your own conversation. You know, I also went down I, back when it was called the WC Handy Awards uh, with, with uh, Taj Mahal and, and my band, the Phantom Blues Band. We toured many years and recorded with, with Taj on, on a lot of records. And, and, but one year we did, we had done our own record with Taj, Taj and the Phantom Blues Band. And, and, and it won, uh, we, well, we won band of the year that year. So, uh, so I remember watching a lot of bands playing there, but there was a band that the house band and it was Levon Helm playing drums mm. and uh, Duke Robillard and uh, Bob Margolin and they played with Muddy Waters. It was a, a group they put together of guys, and that was a group that each each one of those guys was a, aware of the concept that yeah we we speak a language now. They're through through four or five or six of us together, and we're just going to have a conversation. And it was great. And, and compared to a lot of the other bands that I had seen play, which is exactly uh, an exact reading maybe of something they learned off a of record, these guys just played the music. And and uh, I remember when I first worked with Taj Mahal, uh, we had gone in to do a first record with him we had done called Dancing the Blues. This was back in 92 or 93 or something. And, and uh, after a little bit of playing that day, he said, uh, I love you guys because... Uh, he said, you'd speak the language. And I hadn't really thought about the concept of that. He said, we speak a, com- a, a common language, but we have a common vocabulary. And he said, when we get in a room, we, we, we have a conversation. We have a dialogue mm. or whatever it is. Yeah. And he said, that's how you play music. And he said, a lot of guys I've got to come in and play on my records. They know the, 
they know the the form and they know the the, the beats and uh, they plug in sort of the generic stuff and and he said if we all have the same language then we should be able to go have a conversation and he said that's when you're really playing music and and that was really eye opening to me when he said that because I knew that but I didn't he put it in such a way that I hadn't I hadn't heard it before like that is that we're all have these common licks and ideas and stuff that we've learned. And that's our language. We're supposed to have a conversation. You don't have the same conversation that these guys had 20, 30, 40 years ago. They were having a unique conversation the day they made that record. But maybe the next time they played it, when they played it live is a completely different story. Mm, And so uh, I think that's the difference between guys that you really love to hear play and then you kind of go, wow, they all play really well, but they don't move me. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, okay, you played at the Rolling Stones, right? Yep. Now, the Stones started out as a blues band, and I re- remember hearing them live, and they played Little Red Rooster, and it was awesome. It knocked me out. It was like, okay, that's what these guys are, that they're a blues band. What was it like playing with the Stones in terms of just coming from the blues? Well, it's really interesting because I've been working on a B.B. King record, and uh, we had done done a bunch of things with him, and he was doing duets with their, you know, various artists. And uh, and when one night uh, the producer that was producing the record, John Porter, he says, "Hey, can you make it over to Ocean Way? We're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna go over there with B.B. and we're gonna record it with the Stones." And and so. Sure. And so I went in, cause I'm, so I come in with BB. So, I mean, right off the bat, you know, when you come in B, to a Rolling Stones uh, session and you're with BB King, you're kind of okay <laughs> automatically. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Right. And so we were going to be doing an old BB King song called Paying, Paying, Paying the Cost to Be the Boss. Sure. A record that was uh, out probably in the 50s. And uh, so we go in, everybody meets, and we're all sitting around. We're going to record this song live with BB in the room with the Stones and with me and, and, and Daryl Leonard, my, my partner in the Texas Kelly Horns, and we were going to be recording this live in a room. And and so I was going, well, that's cool, because lots of times I would just get called and you know, add the stuff later, and I would never even see the guys. And so I'm going, this is cool. And so basically they somebody got out a, I don't know, a cassette player or put on a, a tape of the original Paying the Cost to Be the Boss, uh, and we all cuddled around it. The whole band sat around and listened to it for like about three or four minutes. Everybody kind of listened to me and the other horn player kind of just copying, quickly copying what the, guy, the original guys did, but not really en- enough to really get an idea of exactly what the arrangement was, but just enough to get a riff in our head, you know. Mm-hmm. And you know that because I'm working with you. You know, it's just we, we, we get a riff together and we go, let's see if this works. And uh and so we, we, everybody got their part, and basically we listened to it for a few minutes. Everybody walked in the room, sat down on their instruments, and we played the song maybe once or twice. And so I was getting a real idea of what it was like playing with those guys when they were playing blues and weren't trying to make a Rolling Stones record. And so I, I think I sort of was serendipitous in a way that I got to see those guys kind of like I originally loved them as a blues band, like you, like you did. Yeah. And because they're in a room playing a shuffle, a B.B. King song, and B.B. sitting there on a stool, you know, about four feet away from me. Mick Jagger's right in front of the horn section, and he's telling the uh, engineer who says, maybe we need to baffle you off so the horns won't go into your micro- your vocal microphone. He's going, oh, no, no. And he said, that's the way those old records were made, everything bleeding into each other. <laughs> I went, I liked you before, and now I like you a lot more. Yeah, you right. <laughs> he said, I don't care if the horns are coming into my microphone. That's what's going to make the stuff sound like the real stuff. I was going, wow, okay. And so, you know, we played a few songs, and um, that's the way it went down. So I got a feeling for what those guys are like when they're not up there doing, you know, Satisfaction or, or Jumping Jack Flash. They're playing a blues song with B.B. King and with the horn section, everybody in the room cutting live, no overdubs, one or two takes. And so I really got a great feel for what the, what it must have been like for them more in the you know in the original days. Now I went uh, two weeks later, was called back in, and we did Bridges to Babylon. So we did their record as well, and that was a whole different thing. I mean, you know, they're they're building the tracks and they're adding horns. I mean, they're there when I when we're putting the horns down. Those guys are very hands on. Keith and and Mick were there when we were doing all all our overdubs. You know, with you know, guidance, well, try this, or could you do this? And so they're, you know, they're very hands-on. Don was was producing, but, you know, those guys are, you know, they have to sign off on what's going down. Yeah, sure. And so 
that was a more traditional experience working with the Rolling Stones. And if I'd had that experience, I would have loved it anyway. But like I say, the the two weeks before a recording with them with BB King really kind of gave me a feeling for what it was kind of what they were really like when they first started out just playing a song. Sure. Sure. Well, speaking of the blues then and modern blues, especially Clapton. So what period did you play with Clapton? Well, I played with Clapton on uh, two different occasions, uh, actually, if, including in a lifetime, three different occasions. Back in 95, when we were uh, recording uh, Phantom Blues, um, Clapton came in just to record with us. So he had said, yeah, you'd, you'd love to come in. And so he was in the room. We were recording live with all, also the stuff that we did with, with Taj Mahal was always everybody in the room, horns, everybody. Rec- learn the song quickly and then, then do a reading of it. Just one or two, three takes, whatever. And so, you know, my first time of ever being around Eric Clapton, I'm sitting in the little horn booth, and he's sitting in a chair about four feet away. I'd never even seen him play live. After all the years of, of loving him, as you know, and loving his music stuff, I'd never even gone to see him live. And so my first time of ever seeing him or hearing him was when I'm in the studio playing with him. So that was, you know, was kind of like, well, I got to see him. By oh, here he is, you know. So he's sitting in a chair. We're all sitting around in the studio, and he's playing live solos. And it was funny because when I first got to the studio, it was Sound City, and I'm sure you know that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he'd been there many times and worked there. Yep. Uh, he, um, he was there before the rest of the guys had got there, and he had a little, uh, once again, a cassette player that was sitting on top of the piano, and he's listening to the parts that he's going to play on a Freddie King song, Lover with the Feeling, and then another song that we did, Here in the Dark, by T-Bone uh, Walker. And so he was sitting there with his guitar, listening to his bits that he was going to be playing on the song when we recorded these two songs. So he was already there before us to kind of doing like a little homework. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. He's like very intently, very, very intently, very focused, you know, listening to, and he's playing along with it and kind of, you know, he's getting his way of, of approaching it. Uh, and it, it sounded very Clapton, but he was, he was playing more or less what, what he was hearing uh, in his own way. And, and like I say, it was both times, the Freddie King and the T-Bone Walker, he was pretty much nailing this stuff. And I'm sure there weren't these weren't songs that he had he'd never played. And plus, that's what he plays, you know? Yeah. That's where you learn from, you know? Yeah. So that was fun. And uh, uh, the next time I worked with him was, I'd come, I came in and did an overdub, me, me in a section. It was some of the Tower Power guys and me and, a, and another guy named Nick Lane on trombone and Duck, Doc Kupka on, the, on baritone. And we went and put horns on this record that he calls, uh, they ever, it was about two or three records ago, and it was called Old Sock. And I was kind of going, well, that's kind of a weird name for a record. And apparently that's what David Bowie called Clapton. <laughs> he said, you're, he said, he said, "You're like a you're you're comfortable like an old sock." Oh, I love it. So that's what he so he called when he would see Clapton. He called him old sock. And this is be you know this is a few years ago. This was before we, you know we lost David Bowie, but um, I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, I think I call my record old sock. Yeah, you right. Can get away with that, but Clapton, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So you've also been an actor, right? You've been in a uh, number of films. Well, I've played music in films, but I really couldn't call myself an actor. I've, I've you know, I've, I've, I've been a musician in, in some films, but I really wouldn't. Where did now? Where exactly did you hear about this particular thing? Oh, I did my research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that I've only been in films as a as a musician on screen, and and, and I really couldn't call that really much of an actor. Uh, you know, <laughs> you're playing yourself. Yeah, I play myself. I, <laughs> you know, we need a band in a scene, you know. Yeah. Hey, you know what? Uh, I, I welcome those times when that happens because the uh, the SAG after, boy, they take care of their members. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's it's funny being a musician, you know, uh, in this world sometimes. It's it, it's hard, you know, and, and I got a, I got a, uh, just a little glimpse doing a few few films as a musician, how SAG after kind of takes care of their, their people, you know, I was kind of like, Oh, well, I'm getting residuals and stuff. <laughs> it's always nice, huh? Yeah. Who would have thought that? Yeah. Okay. So you were elected to the blues hall of fame. How cool is that? Oh, I've, I've, I'm honored, you know, I, I'm honored. I'm very honored. You know, I mean, so oftentimes playing this kind of music, you know, people don't really get any kind of 
any kind of uh, recognition, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. Can you point to one magic session or magic gig that you did that was just off the charts that really sticks out above all the rest? Hmm. Well, I think I might have mentioned a few already when, when I'm talking about working with B.B. King. I mean, we did one, one of, before we went in with the Stones. And, of course, I was, you know, early on, I mean, when I heard, uh, when I heard uh, Thrill is Gone, I mean, that sort of just sort of tilted me. And that was, what, what 1968, 69 or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah. Almost like 15 or 16 or something, you know. And when I heard that, that just uh, the feeling, once again, you know, we were talking about the feeling and not the form. I mean, that was a blues song that had strings on it. And there's French horns and stuff in the background, but not to, not, you know, you as a producer knows sometimes that can be a, a, uh, I can be a horrible thing, you know, when you have that stuff, but it was so tastefully, tastefully done. And it was a minor blues and it just got me. And so I was a huge fan and, and, and was, had been listening to BB for a long time before I ever met him. And I met him probably through working with Stevie Ray Vaughan live on some gigs or maybe he really, really didn't do, he only did Antone's one time. And that was at the very beginning of Antone's career. I mean, he was really kind of too big to go play Antone's in Austin. He was playing big places and stuff. And so when I finally got to meet him, I'd actually been a musician a long time and had really played with a lot of the blues people and stuff. So he was always just an uh, incredible gentleman, always remen- remembered me when I would see him, and he would remember where he'd last seen me. And I, 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 you know, you can tell I truly loved the guy. So when I finally got to record with him, we, we, dec- we were going to redo uh, Thrill is Gone. And uh, my partner, Daryl, had written a really good arrangement that kind of approximated the original, and it was Tracy Chapman was going to be doing a duet with him, and we went in the studio and recorded that song live with all the players. There was even a cu- there were a couple of French horn players. There was a guy playing uh, cello. You know, mm-hmm. it was uh, an approximation of a, of a version of the song with BB just doing another you know another version of it. And so being, to be in the studio and recording "Thrill Is Gone" live, you know, not even have to go in later as an overdub, but being in, you know, I could see him in the. Uh, by this time, we'd already done uh, a few cuts with him, but I could see him, you know, right in front of me, probably maybe 10 feet away in the booth, singing and playing live. And we did two takes. And the thing I noticed is that, once again, he was not a, a form guy. He was a guy that he played the feeling. And it could be 10 different takes, and they would all be wonderful. And he did two takes, and they were completely different. And he comes out of the, uh, the, out of the, the booth, and he's got tears in his eyes. And I mean, it almost made me want to cry. And he was just going, and I was going, well, B, what's wrong, man? And he's going, oh, nothing wrong. It's just so great. I just so love that. And, and I was going, wow. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, what an honor, right? And, and so we, we started talking and I said, I said, B, you said you played two completely different solos and they were both great. They were just completely different. And he says to me, he goes, well, you know, I can't play the same thing twice. <laughs> <laughs> he said I had to, I had to be uh, a leader of my own band. He said I don't know, I, I don't know many chords on the guitar. You know, <laughs> I'm a soloist and a singer. And he said the 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 soloing is an extension of my singing. And he said I always had to have a really good rhythm guitar player in there playing the chords. And he said so I had to, you know, kind of had that my own band because he said I wasn't good at learning other people's stuff. And I said, well, thank God for that. You yeah. Know? <laughs> So, I mean, that one stands out. I mean, recording with, with, with BB and the Stones was also a re- really cool thing. There's been, a, there's been some nice ones, I'm, uh, uh, you know, that maybe are not really big and famous ones, like working with Percy Sledge. And, and once again, he teared up because we'd all come together on this record. You know, Steve Cropper was on it and James Gadson and, you know, wow. a wealth of great players had come together to do a record with him, and he hadn't had a chance to record in, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years. And he's in the studio, and we, we did a record on, on him, which got nominated for a Blues Award, and I think might have gotten nominated in the uh, Grammy uh, uh, category as well. And he was just so moved that he was getting to do a record again that he had tears in his eyes. So, you know, if you can sort of be, be somewhat part of moving some of your favorite artists to tears, you know, you think, well, I must... We must be doing our job right, you know, and yeah, and, yeah. and to all of us, it's just an honor being in their, these people's presence. You know, we don't think we're doing anything special. We 
we just kind of think that they're uh, allowing us and maybe, you know, causing us to be better than we normally would be just to be in their presence. And I do find that to be true. If I'm playing with really incredible artists, they kind of lift you up to their level. I have one BB story. I used to be friends with the guys that would mix the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. So this is going back a ways. But I would go over in the afternoon and I would visit them And usually around three o'clock is when the guest artist would come in, if it was a band or a musical artist, would come in and and do their check. And I happened to be there one day when B.B. King was there. And B.B. tore it up. He tore it up. So much so that he got a standing ovation from the crew after it was finished during a sound check. Uh And you know how jaded these guys are. They've been there. They've heard it all. But everybody, Uh when I'm talking about it, the hairs in the back of my head are standing up because it was like so electric. You were firsthand there to get something like that, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. I feel fortunate, too. And and like like you say, electric and inspirational and even the most, you know, I did the Tonight Show back there when that original, you know, Johnny Carson and that whole crew, I think the first talk show that I ever did after I moved out here was with Johnny Carson, you know, and, uh, and that you're absolutely you're tr- uh, right. That crew, the sound guys and the stage guys, they were jaded as you can possibly imagine. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, they just were like phoning it in and they, I remember going over to Ed Shaughnessy's drum set, you know, with when the tonight show orchestra and I walked over and looked at the drums and they were like cigarette butts <laughs> stuck into like the Tom Tom. He's using the Tom Tom <laughs> as an ashtray. Yeah. It was the most nasty like drum set you've ever seen in, in your life. And, and I asked the guy, so what happens? He said, well, he keeps using it as an ashtray and, until like on, on one of the performances, he hits that Tom Tom and then his stick goes through and it's time to change the head. <laughs> you know, that's how, you know, that's how jaded those guys were, you know, were, I mean, even the, you know, I mean, they were all happy to be there. Of course, you know, that was, you know, what's enough to like about a gig like that. You sure. know, you go and you work in the afternoon for a few hours and you go out and play a nightclub and play jazz or something, you sure. know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know? But yeah. yeah, they they were jaded, and uh, BB I think because BB was always playing straight from the heart. Once again, getting back to the twelve bar and uh, the form instead of the feeling. BB King could bring that feeling, that solo ability, on almost any kind of music. You heard you've heard him do it on soundtracks where he's playing, or he's playing with the Crusaders, or he's playing with you know Bono or something. You know, he brought that feeling that ability to speak with the guitar, he brought that to anything that he played. And so if he was playing with a rock and roll band or a funk band or whatever, he always brought that in because he, because he was speaking from the heart. And so to me, I think that's what I learned from BB is that it's about the feeling and, you know, don't have a bunch of preset patterns and try not to, you know, try to always say something, you know, if you can, that's it, it, if not original heartfelt, you know, you know, with me, by the time I saw B.B., I think he was sitting in a chair, mostly. or He's pretty stationary, and I remember thinking of him in, in that way. But then I remember seeing something from the early 60s where he played in a club in New York, and he was standing, and he was so dynamic, and he was oh, animated, gosh, yeah. and he was yeah. he was just commanding in a way that he wasn't in later years, in the same way anyway, but I got a different impression of him because he was shouting, gospel shouting in oh, a way. Yeah. It, it was so cool. I remember out of all the artists, and there was quite a number of all-stars on that, that was the one that really stood out. I was like, wow, that's B.B.? Wow. That. Even though he was always a little bit of a rotund kind of guy, he moved and grooved and, and just took it to the audience. I mean, he did it well into, you know, we did it well with Toss. We did a lot of B.B. King tour stuff, you know. It would be, be, be the B.B. King tour, and there would be, you know, eight or ten bands. And our slot was always right before. He loved Taj, and, and our, our slot would be the last slot before B.B. came on. And so we would stick around. We would just, like, leave the stage, and pretty soon he was on. We were sitting in chairs along the side. I saw, like, I don't know, dozens and dozens of, of shows. And he was beginning to sit down by this time. But every once he, he was still able at this time to get up out of the chair when he was really moved, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd seen him originally probably for the first time in, uh, you know, 1970 or something, or, you know, a few couple years after Thrill is Gone. And so I got to see him being that young guy. That, but even through his, his, his 
forties, fifties, sixties, and even into his seventies, he was dynamic. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, he could really move it, you know, it's great, you know, very cool, Joe. Last question. What's the best piece of business advice that you learned? Either maybe somebody told you or you learned along the way. I have that one really easily ready at my fingertips. And, and I think you will relate to this as a lifelong musician, producer. I talked, I was on a session when I first got out here and I, you know, uh, I, uh, I was talking to this, this saxophone player and he was on the session. He was a guy that I knew about. He was a big band guy and he'd been around for a long time and he had laid, laid down a section on a song and I came in and play a soprano solo on this one other song. And he was still there when I got there. <clears throat> I said, you got any advice for me? I'm new to town and just, you know, I thought he was going to give me some, you know, jazz player, you know, Here's what you do on this altered chord with the flat five and the raised nine, or you know, just something <laughs> along those lines. Yeah, and I thought it was what he was going to tell me, and he goes, he goes, okay, Joe, I got some good advice for you. And I said, what? And he goes, he said, here's the thing. He said, when your accounts work, you work, and when your accounts don't work, you can, there's nothing you can do, you know, come hell or high water, to get them work to to work. Mm-hmm. And and I said, well, f- wait. First of all, I said. What's an account? <laughs> he goes, you know, the cats that hire you, man. You know, the, if, you, if you're working with a big band or you're working with this producer or you're working on this job, he said, those are your accounts. I said, oh, okay. I've never heard that term, you know, coming from Austin, you know. Yeah. I said, you know, and he said, when, so when your accounts work, you work, and when they don't, you don't. So he said, so when you're working and you're, like, making a bunch of money, he said, be putting that money away he said, as if you're not making that money, because he said, when the times come, when you got a week or a month or a couple months or whatever, he said, you're going to be real happy. You didn't spend it all when you were making it. And he said, that's one of the most important things a professional musician can know is to always kind of act like you're, even if you're making big do- dollars, kind of act like you're making small dollars. And so I don't know if I got, if I really was, did took to his advice, you know, as well as I should have. But I always thought about that when when, when it's kind of uh, when when things are a little slow and I would think, well, oh, man, that cat told me, man, he said, you know, save your money because you're a musician and you're going to really when it rains when it when it rains it really pours and when it doesn't it's dry. Yeah. And so he was trying to tell me, you know, be smart about your bread, you know. And I think that was great advice. I mean, did I heed it completely? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> 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 we never do, do we? You know, I, I still think about it though to this very day when, when there when there's a slow period I go, Oh man, the cat man, he told me, he told me way back <laughs> when, you know. You, you know, I, I thought I was gonna get some kind of genius you know, it was genius really what he told me. I thought I was gonna kinda of get some like, you know, golden key, <laughs> you know, saxophone, uh, here's if you listen to this guy or you you go and find this book, you're gonna really be okay. I didn't get any of that from him. Just save your money, dude. That was basically it. And so I think it was good advice. I wish, you know, sometimes, sometimes I wish I'd, I'd been a little bit more, you know, like he said I should be, but you know, that's where it goes. Yeah, I understand. Well, this is great. I'm glad we got a chance to talk. Me we, too, man. We have a, a similar background in a lot of ways. I did a lot of blues. Yeah, I, I produced a lot of blues uh, in the early '90s. Uh, Joe Houston, the saxophone player, the Blues oh, guy. I love Joe Houston, yeah. I did a couple of records with him. I actually did a, a couple of really short tours with him as as well, which <laughs> was very much the, like your experience at Antone's, where he would turn around, he'd call a song, and he'd call a key, and it wouldn't be the key that he would call, and we weren't sure exactly what the tempo was or anything. We, he would count oh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. He'd count it off yeah. at one tempo and then play it at another one. So <laughs> I know I played with him one one night. I played backed him up at the Greek. It was like one of these old rock and roll shows, and he came out. And he, I think that time that I played with him, it, it kind of worked out okay. But I, I'll tell you something. Um, I played with Earl King. Yeah, remember Earl King? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. New Orleans. Yeah. Well, ironically enough, um, I just worked on this record. It's Reese Winans from Double Trouble. Uh, uh, Joe Bonamas is going to produce a record on his keyboard player, Reese, and Reese oh, was in Double Trouble. Yes, yes, J.J. Blair. J.J. Blair, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's my yeah. buddy. He told me he was doing it. Yeah, he loved it. 
So they call me. They call me and say, uh, you know, Chris Layton called me from uh, from from Nashville. And he said, yeah, I, I would just talk to Joe Monomos. He's going to want you to play on it because you played on the original. And it had been 29 years ago that I played on the original Caught in a Crossfire with, with with Chris and Tommy and Stevie and all the guys. And and the trumpet player that I was playing with uh, that uh, back then was still I still play with with Daryl Leonard. So he said, yeah, they're going to call you. And so I got a call and I went in and. And uh, and was recording "Caught in a Crossfire." It was Sam Moore singing. You know, Stevie's no longer with him, and it was uh, it was uh, Kenny Wayne Shepherd playing guitar, and then uh, uh, Chris Layton, Tommy Shannon, and Reese Winans. It's Reese Winans' record, which which uh, Bonamassa is uh, is uh, producing. Yeah. And so uh, so Joe goes, "Hey man, you know," I said, "Joe, so like." He goes, "Yeah, yeah, I know you played on the original." And I said, "Well, last time I saw you, Joe." was when you were 12 years old, I backed you up out here. And he's going, oh, my God, I remember that gig. And he said the guitar player was playing like a bird land through like a tweed fender. I mean, he remembered everything. <laughs> and I said, and I said, it was you. And I said, it was Earl King. And it was Larry Texas Flood Davis. We said it at the same time. It was funny because he goes, <laughs> Larry Texas Flood. And he goes, yeah, I remember that gig. And I said, do you remember? You probably don't remember this because you weren't in on it. But I said, we... We did our set with Earl King, and we had run songs in the afternoon with you, and we ran songs for Larry Davis, and everything was fine. And then we ran songs for Earl King. And when we got out to play with Earl King, he did every song a half step up. <laughs> and so we started, we started playing the song that we had rehearsed in G or in G sharp or whatever. He, it's like he had drank cough syrup or something. You know, he was completely <laughs> fucked up, <laughs> you know? And, and he said, wow. He said, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know if I remember that. And I said, yeah. So I said, I said, experience with you when you were 12 was good. And Larry Davis and then Earl King was, was like, he's, you know, so it's that <laughs> Joe Houston thing you're talking about. You know, it's like, you know, you were, you rehearse the songs and then you go out and then they start playing in a different key and everybody's scuffling, you know. Well, we, we didn't <laughs> even rehearse the songs. He would just call them and everybody in the oh, band. Oh, he'd in the wrong key. He would call, no, he'd call a song that nobody knew and also a oh, song right. in the wrong key and counted off at a different tempo when we'd all look at each other yeah, like, right. what the hell is going on? So it would be a train wreck for the first first 12 bars until we kind of figured it out, and then it would be okay after that, but it was really an adventure. Oh, man, well, that's that's, that's what playing live music is, isn't it? You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> And then lots of times it's good, and sometimes it's like, oh, my God, I just barely <laughs> got through that. <laughs> <laughs> You can find out more about Joe at joesublet.net. That's not .com, .net, N-E-T. Joe Sublet, J-O-E-S-U-B-L-E-T-T, dot net. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab or Go to bobbyoinnercircle.com or find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, and Google Play. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyoinnercircle.com, you'll also find a sign-in form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. Bobby.